This is Taking the Lead, a podcast for B2B tech professionals, leaders, and executives who want to learn from female icons in the tech industry. In each episode, host Christina Brady interviews women who are driving revenue for some of the most respected tech companies in the world. Are you ready to get inspired? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Lead. I'm Christina Brady. I am the host and the SVP of sales at Speckit, which is an incredible company with a wonderful product that helps you and every single one of your employees maximize every minute at work by surfacing the learning that you need in bite-sized format when you need it within the tools you are already using. We can eliminate distractions entirely, which is a big statement, but I promise we follow it up with the real deal. I could not be more excited to have another Christina on the show. I have Christina here with me. She is the president of Personal ABM. And if that's any hint into what we're going to dive into, get ready and buckle up. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. From one Christina to another, thank you. Again, as you said, president of Personal ABM, we focus on the one-to-one portion of ABM. Oh, can't wait to dive in. And before we get there, Tell us a little bit about your personal journey, how you got where you are, how you found your way to your current company. Tell us a little bit of the tale of how how you got to be this incredible executive woman in this space. It's kind of an accident, but a happy accident. <laughs> yes. I was doing corporate for first couple of years out of school. Uh, and then I started working on the side with other marketers and I kind of fostered or I should say evolved into this role. And we grew the company to be focusing on the interactions before we were focusing, you know, we find that a lot of people are focusing on scaling versus the interactions that's really going to get you the higher value deals. Um, And I became president, which was fantastic because working for myself, I would not have it any other way. (laughs) Ah, I love that. And now had you always had, had ABM sort of been you know, your niche, like the corner that you went into? Had you always been a serial marketer? What did you do before that that sort of led you to this path? I would say serial marketer, but then I started getting a little more personal, a little more relevant to each person, the person that we were targeting in each account. And I noticed that ABM was a really great way to do that. But I noticed that with the evolution of ABM tech, we were kind of moving away from what true ABM is all about. And I really like the aspect where you're tying it to revenue, tying it more specifically to bottom line goals as opposed to pipeline and maybe demand. Do you find that elements like ABM are often really, really misunderstood? Like I feel people throw that terminology around a lot, but it's very difficult to actually uncover what does it actually mean? What has it evolved into? And then how do you properly deploy the strategy within your organization? So don't don't worry if you're all like, tell us, we will. We're going to go one at a time. So you mentioned sort of this evolution within ABM. Let's kind of start really, really high level because you're the expert. What actually is account-based programs, account-based marketing? What is it? So to me, account-based marketing, experience, selling, whatever you want to buzzword you want to use it, it's all about getting an account to revenue, bottom line. It's not pipeline. It's not building demand. It's, It's almost... Because of we, what I mentioned has been evolving, it, it was focused initially on tech because a lot of ABM tech came out over the last, I don't know, 10 plus years. And people were focusing on making a targeted demand gen program when it really should be about getting accounts to revenue. So it's not about pipeline. It's about how are we going to progress this, this account? Are we going to shorten the sales cycle? Are we going to expand the deal size? So it's not when I when I hear people mention ABM, a lot of them associate it with technology. And to me, it's not. Like if you ask someone, AB, what does ABM mean to them? You're going to get a hundred different definitions. But it's definitely, it's not so synonymous with tech. And we've seen that people have kind of gotten away from that personal relevant side and focusing on building that pipeline. So for example, a conversational AI a call center, excuse me, conversational AI company came to us. They had deals at a half million dollar size. They were building a pipeline. In their case, they were using demand base and they were really having great success building the pipeline, but they were really challenged with their accounts going dark or getting stuck in the funnel for whatever reason. And we took a deeper look at their content and we noticed why they were struggling with stage progression because their content was really focused on awareness, consideration, purchase. 
And what they really needed to do to get those accounts that were stuck was create demand, capture demand, progress demand. So basically close a deal, retain a deal, expand the deal. But like I said, ABM is not about building awareness. It creating demand by reframing, reframing the accounts of specific target accounts that can provide the re greatest revenue growth. So we needed to change the content to specifically target the organizations that they wanted to address. So they came to us with this issue with their pipeline and one organization or that they were targeting was Bank of America. It happens to be a huge bank. They already had conversational AI that they had developed in-house. So content that was talking about conversational AI and the need for it was basically awareness and it wasn't going to help them progress that deal. It wasn't going to change their status quo. They weren't going to teach for differentiation based on that. So they really needed to show, our client really needed to show how they understood Bank of America, their strategic vision as a whole, how they understood their tool, Erica, the AI, and how they could better supplement it. And that's one of the key things that organizations are and teams in general are focusing or missing that they're focused teaching for persona or excuse me, talking to personas, talking to industries, but not actual organizations themselves. What's happening in that target organization? And that's why the personal is so important when it comes to the one to one ABM. And that's hard to scale because how is this different very much than, you know, your traditional way of prospecting, which is usually let me just throw a bunch of mass hooks and get messaging that kind of aligns like, for example, if I'm going to be sending outreach to all VPs of sales within the fintech industry, I can use a template and I can tap and make that feel really relevant to a broad amount of folks. But it sounds like what you're describing is a much more personalized focus on individualized accounts and how we market and create demand within those individual accounts. How do you do that at scale? So the one-to-one -one aspect is not scalable or yeah. It is scalable, but it loses a lot of the nuances. And this approach that I'm talking about is for organizations that are selling six, seven figure deals, longer sales cycles, complex deals. But what you learn from the one to one can be applied to the one to few and one to many to the campaigns that you're running to supplement it. So these are organizations for the one to one that you know have a fit, have an internal strategic need that you can help them with, whether your tools or offerings can supplement that. And there's a couple of things that are going on, you know, organizationally, maybe they just got acquired, maybe they got a funding, maybe they have a specific initiative that they want that you, your solution can fit into. And there's intent more than maybe just it on one person. So strategic intent across the board. So it, it's, it's really for those tier one accounts. It's not going to be for the lower hanging fruit. It's not going to be for the accounts that are totally cold. They have maybe some engagement and they went dark for whatever reason. So you have to be specific with what you're going to, um, which accounts you're going to put into the pipeline. So almost I ask marketers to make sure that sales proves that this is an account that they want to target because it requires so much time, so much effort and so much money. Got it. And is that usually where you see organizations that succeed with ABM? They have to, they essentially have this hit list of accounts. And then what kind of criteria do you usually think should kind of go into that? So if I'm a sales rep and I sitting down with my leadership and I want to deploy this strategy for my, I'll call it my whale accounts. If, if a, if a seven-figure deal is a whale account for you, amazing. We're talking about you. Where do I begin to build this strategy and differentiate from the rest of my book and what how I'm focusing on those? So it's almost like you have to do research or homework on those whale accounts. So are they whale accounts because you want them or are they whale mm -hmm. accounts for a reason? So if you can answer why we're targeting it, not just because I want that logo in my book or not because, you know, I know that we can help them. If you can answer what it is you're targeting about, then that makes it a little more enticing to the marketing leader to put that because it's a very, there's content that's bespoke to it. There's maybe case studies that might be bespoke for that particular account. So it has to be a really big why, not just a want. It has to be, why are we showing this? And you can't just say, oh, well, they showed intent. They were on the website. Well, why were they showing intent? Can you prove to me why you think or hypothesize why you think that they were showing intent and give me a little more insight? So if the salesperson or the rep can come to marketing or leadership, whoever it is that would decide that we're going to maybe use this one-to-one -one approach, they have to actually build a case for it. Because if you're not building a case for it, then it's automatically a no. Got it. 
And it's difficult, too, because doing all of the research up front, it obviously takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of acumen. You're likely doing customized messaging, like you mentioned, even customized case studies, which, to your point, you can use those later on. There's a lot of time in the very beginning. Is there anything that you do differently with these accounts to try to ignite the front of the funnel? Because I would imagine that your outreach strategy is very similar. You're just leading with a more targeted message. So do you find that folks have an easier time front of funnel engaging a prospect and getting them to talk to them? Or is it just as difficult to get them on the phone or get them an email? And then once you do, the strategy really kicks in. It totally depends. But what we've noticed is if they are building a relationship on knowledge and shared knowledge, especially on LinkedIn or however it is they're engaging with their prospects, if they build a relationship based on, I want to share with you, I'm not going to pitch you the minute you connect with me on LinkedIn, or I'm going to share an actual piece of content or knowledge with you. Not like we should connect because I can help you and you're in my industry or whatever, but it should be, it is hard, but you have to change the mindset of if you were the salesperson or if you were in the person that you're trying to initiate a conversation with, would you ignore that message? Or would you actually take it because you're sharing knowledge with me as opposed to sharing all about you? Right. So that is something that you can get hyper relevant to that person on LinkedIn um, more than, you know, my tool can, we've seen other people in your industry. No, I know that, you know, Bank of America is going through this particular, their focus is on this for this year. And I want to share you how other financial companies are achieving X and share, 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 not like pitch them right away. <laughs> pitch the pitch slap, right? The, the LinkedIn invite. Yes, and then the, thank like you those. for, <laughs> thank you for accepting my invitation. I'm sure that we can help you. Here's my Calendly link. <laughs> Schedule time with me. Let's go. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait to do that. <laughs> if you're listening, don't, don't do that. Thinking about the ways in which ABM is often misunderstood. Do you find that there's a lot of companies, even with the best of intention or a lot of reps or whoever it may be that's deploying the strategy, they still don't see the result that they want? Like, what is the, the success to failure ratio on a typical ABM motion? So it also depends if they're tech focused or not and what their mm. success, what, what's successful to them. Are they trying to fill the pipeline? Are they trying to close more deals? Are they trying to progress deals or trying to expand? There's different ways of doing ABM. So Depending if you're focused on net new expansion, retention, or, you know, like a combination of those. I think the most successful ABMers are ones that do a mix of ABM tech using it for demand and then seeing what's not actually progressing and then taking that one to one approach for those accounts. So I think it's, it's not just all ABM tech, it's not just all this one to one, it's a mix and a balance. And I think a lot of people sales and marketing forget that ABM is a long play. It is a strategy. It's not a, if I don't get results in 30 days, we're ditching it. We need at least a quarter, sometimes two quarters to see results. And I think a lot of people don't see any results because they don't give it enough time or they're focusing too much on tech and not on the strategy. I'm a full, a firm believer that you can use ABM tech, but it's a piece of the puzzle and it should support your strategy, not the other way around. Yeah. Why do you find that it usually takes a little bit longer? Why is it a long play? Because you're trying to get a buying vision or a, build the buying vision off for a bigger buying committee. So if you're just selling to one person, ABM maybe not be, might not be the way to you. But if you know that you're going to need three, four, or five people to sign off on this, then it's going to take longer. That's why the one-to-one -one that we use is only for people that are going to be selling these five, six-figure deals that have three to six-month sales cycles, maybe even longer. It's not for someone that's selling a small deal like under 100K or, you know, th that would be maybe more of a volume play. This is definitely not that tool yeah. for them. Is there a way to incorporate ABM to more of a volume play? Because I do, I mean, you know, because because the size is all relative. I know some companies where a $100,000 deal, it's a massive deal, right? Like that would yes. warrant the reps. Like if your ASP is 15 grand and you're like, wow, I've got a $100,000 deal that I can close. Do you feel like the same principles apply there? The same principles apply that and they might be focusing more on the one to few and one to many. But what they can do is go back to their customers 
the, their initial customers, their initial prospects, obviously, because they had they were initially prospects, and see where they, why they won with them, what what was going on with them, what made them buy, what strategic initiatives were happening in that organization, how you know, examine that deal, and then you can apply it to the one to ones, and you can. You can even use that to do the one to few and one to many, but those, those to me are more of the demand. So you're using tech, you're using email, you're using LinkedIn, but you can definitely say to get as more relevant as possible, that's how you're going to get the bigger deals. Got it. And then is there, so if you, if you wanted to scale these principles a little bit, what would you say is, so like gold standard is everything feels one-to-one, but it's very, very worth it, right? It's fewer deals, big monsters taking a little bit longer. And then on the flip side of that, right, if we flip the pendulum all the way the other way, there's this mass outreach kind of spray and pray (laughs) methodology that I think a lot of people wind up doing. If you wanted to land somewhere in the middle, are there elements of this that you feel like can be less hyper personalized and easier to do in larger scope? Yeah, I would. It's all about tailoring for relevance and teaching away from status quo, because I'm sure you're familiar with the challenger sale. We take aspects of that in what we're doing. So if you can be hyper relevant, if you can be hyper focused on what's different from your competitors, what's different than status quo, because I'm sure as sellers, you got your listeners and you know that when you can say that doing nothing is more expensive and more costly to them versus implementing this tool is a game changer for a conversation. So that's the type of thing that you have to figure out what's going to work and what's historically worked for you as a seller. And then you can apply that and just, I always tell people to slow down a little bit and say, what I'm sending, is it relevant? Does it, is there a purpose for it at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to send that email, what, what is my goal for that email other than them opening it? Do I want them to actually what, listen to this podcast? Do I want them to download this case study? It's not get them on the calendar as soon as possible. Right. Well, and that's big because your prospects can tell, like your prospects can tell if you're sending them a really fluffy email and ultimately all you want is to take up their time, which is the thing that they don't want to give you. So that becomes super hyper obvious also. And the other thing around deploying a strategy like this, do you find that at most organizations you'll have almost individual reps who are deploying this strategy because they have the training or they have the history? Or is this usually a company wide initiative that involves multiple facets of go to market? So I've seen both, but the most effective ones are multiple facets of go-to-market. This has to be something that's like adopted across the board from C-suite down. So sales has to be on board. Marketing has to be on board. Even customer success has to be on board because it will be successful on a one-on-one basis, but you don't want just one rep being really successful. You want the whole entire team being successful. It's a go-to-market strategy. It's not a marketing only strategy or sales only strategy. It's how are we going to interact with our audience, our customers, our prospects, and keep them longer once they become clients. So it is a strategy that needs top-down initiative. But if you can try to build the case, like if if you're in this organization where you're hitting a wall and no one understands it, try to prove it by your success. And then you can go to your leaders and say, you know, I think this is something that we should adopt as a department or as an initiative to, you know, go to market as a team together. So it, it, I understand what mean it, it can be successful both ways, but the best success is the one C, C suite got bought in. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Cause I, I do think that what, where this winds up happening and it almost feels organic is you'll have one lone wolf account executive or sales leader that has deployed the strategy, been trained on it. It's worked in another organization and then they bring it to your company, but they don't necessarily get the support of their cross-functional partners in ops or marketing or even product, certainly not C-suite maybe, because it feels like a new initiative that is a longer play, that's a bit more of a slow burn, that's going to take resources, right? Ideally, my guess would be you'd want marketing involved in some of the, the messaging or the collateral or the case studies. You would want ops to make sure that they're tracking it properly and that we have places to delineate different points of contact and how we want to multi-thread. And you would want the support of all of those organizations. But oftentimes, if you're coming in and nobody's done it before, you kind of have to be a little bit of that lone wolf and prove it out. 
So it's good to know that that is what you see sometimes and that that can work. You also mentioned client success a couple of times, and I want to focus there because how do you feel like client success, assuming that you don't have full cycle AEs where they are closing deals, renewing deals, running all of expansion and upsells. Let's say you have a model where you've got AEs that are landing, you've got CS that is expanding. How do they utilize similar principles for their side of the house to make it make sense? Yeah, well, I feel like they have to have a little bit of a different conversation because what I've seen is a lot of customer success is having the same conversation as they were as sales, but they're already with you. So now you have to prove your value. You have to explain what you did, the results achieved, and where there's room for growth, where there's room for opportunity, where you see that they can grow as a company, but with you as that partner. So I, that conversation, it's almost... They're similar conversations, but you can't treat a customer the same way you would treat a prospect. You right. can't just say, oh, we did X, Y, Z for you. And these are the results. You can, you got to see how much that result affected the company. Whether if you're selling, let's say you're selling into a sales team, how did it affect sales as an organization? But then how did it affect the whole company? How did it affect revenue? How did it affect RevOps or how you could get as multi-threaded and expanded in there? But you can't just say, we did X, and this is why you need to stay with us. It's more of, we see opportunities for growth. So then they will see you as a growth partner versus just a vendor. Yeah. You know, that kind of makes me think of an interesting question is my guess is there's a lot of organizations out there that could be benefiting from a strategy like this and they aren't doing that. And let's say that you're sitting on the customer success, client success, the CSM or account management side of the house. And you have what appears to be an amazing deal partner that closes on the new business side of the house, followed a very traditional motion. It comes over to you and you're their CSM and your job is to adopt the product, mitigate the risk, expand, upsell, and renew. And you realize, hey, there's an opportunity for me to sort of switch this into more of an ABM motion after the initial close. Do you ever see or even advocate for that where you flip into that motion once they become a customer and get hyper personalized at that point to keep them with you? Yes, because account based approach isn't necessarily marketing. It could be I like to say it's associated account based revenue. So mm -hmm. how are we going to retain them? So once they're here, we, OK, we have them for a year, we have them for three years. What can we do to make sure they stay longer and they expand into different solutions or offerings that we have? or they expand further into their organization so they get more seats depending what you're selling and what's that value that we can bring to them. But they're still like, you don't forget about them because they're a client. Obviously, we all know that it's easier to keep a, a client than it is to get a new one. So we want to make sure, especially now when the economic ish situation we're going through, retention is a big focus for a lot of our clients and for what we've been seeing. So you have to treat them still as they are an account that you are catering to. So you're getting relevant to them. So stay on top of what's going on inside of their organization. And I'm not saying doing a full-blown account research on them, but stay abreast of what's going on, whether that's in their news, on their website, press releases that they have, or what you're learning from your actual contact within that organization so that you can better serve them later because retention is definitely key. Absolutely. And this is often where I think doing mass activities with the aim of retention can sometimes hurt people because at the end of the day, we have a lot of CSMs right now, especially that have an overloaded book. They're working with a lot of different accounts and they know, okay, my strategy is I have to do quarterly business reviews. I got to jump on the line with them. I got to walk through the data. I have to listen for buying language. I have to identify when we're about to lose a customer. I need to look out for churn. And what it winds up coming across like is always, Hey, let's get on a quarterly call so I can check in with you and see how it's going. Then more and more customers yeah, and are on. like, look, yeah, and move on, right? And if I've got if I've got 25 tools in my tech stack, which actually these days would put me in one of like the smaller <laughs> tool or tech stacks, right? I don't want to have 25 conversations every quarter just checking in and seeing how it's going. And that was the old way it worked then, but but it doesn't work now. And so Advice for CSMs, how can they m show more value at that point than just, hey, let's hop on a call and see how it's going. You mentioned 
blog posts or webinars, but do you feel like there needs to be an evolution in general on the CSM side of the house and how we approach and deliver data and analytics to our customers? Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to probably, I've seen, actually, I've started to see this, that a lot of businesses are having webinars based just for their clients so they can become stickier, so that they can see what's going on, so that they can speak to the challenges that maybe the, their customers are facing with their solutions and either improve the solution, so give that to product that insights, or see how they can better serve them internally. And then when they're speaking to each other or are learning from each other, they see, well, this, this particular company is achieving X using that same solution or tool. Maybe we should, should too. So I think it does have to evolve from the quarterly check-ins. And I know that this is something that requires time, but if marketing can run that for them and then get CS involved in maybe the conversation that they need to have, marketing could then use that another way. So it's not just going to be a, a CS type of webinar or roundtable or whatever discussion you want to have. So it's something that they can continually use and then they could put it maybe as an asset on the site so other people can speak to it. And then when the CS goes, maybe the next quarter or two quarters down the line, they could say, you know, we had this conversation with these organizations, they were experiencing X here, take a look at this. So they're giving them a resource resource as customer success, as well as asking them what's going on and just instead of doing that, you know, generic check-in. Yeah, just, just check in and go through all of your data and take up an hour of your time that you don't have to provide you something that you could have just emailed me, right? That's my biggest thing is if you are serving your customers in any way, shape or form and what you're about to deliver to them, whether it's on the new business side of the house, whether it's on the CS side of the house, if what you're about to deliver them can be very, very easily understood, read, and digested in an email, it's not a great use of a meeting. It's a waste of their time, right? Send them an email and then figure out a way if you need to get in front of them to really make that time worth it, which And I even know, if it's more complicated, do a video. Yeah. Do a yeah. video and send them the video and say, like, I'm going to sh- XYZ type of thing. I mean, and then if, you, if this doesn't right make now, any yes. more sense, here's my calendar. Let's schedule a time to go walk through it. That way you have a specific goal in mind. It's personal and relevant to them. It doesn't seem like you just shot that email to all your customers or all your prospective customers. Right. There you go. It's just a little layer of personal relevance. A little layer of personal relevance. And honestly, recording a two minute video, you could knock out 10 of those in a day. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, like especially if you're if you're following an ABM motion. To your top customers, these are the things that you can deploy, right? Like a personalized video message to them where they know, to your point, you didn't just send that to a thousand people because you said my name, you said my company, you talked about my issues. You've clearly done your research and you're letting me get this warm introduction to you and your product and what you offer without taking up my calendar time. Kind of makes me want to give you my calendar time now, right? Like Fantastic. Yeah. And then if yeah. there's a goal in mind for that call, as opposed to just, I need to tell you why you need to use us, then that's a... I'm going to take that call because there's a goal and there's a specific reason why and there's an agenda versus I'm going to get a demo for 20 minutes and I'm not going to learn anything. Yeah. I mean, I have I have messages in my inbox right now and I'm sure you do, too. That's the first time they've emailed. Nice to meet you. This is my company. I am positive that we can help you set time here. And you're like, (laughs) wow. (laughs) Okay. I can't wait. I can't wait to talk to you. Yeah. Sign Uh, me up. Sign me up. Well, this has been an amazing chunk of time just diving into something super tactical, which is one of my favorite things to do on the show is really dig into something super specific that we can get, that we can learn from, that we can go and do right now today. And that brings us to our rapid reveal section, if you are open to it. I am definitely open. I'm excited. What do you got? Let's do it. Okay. So I've got three questions for you. You've got 60 seconds or less to answer each. So number one. What's your favorite board game? And more importantly, why? Mm, okay. So if you had asked me this in like 20, or no, now we're looking at it 30 years ago, I would have said Monopoly, obsessed with Monopoly. But right now with my kid, I love Sar- Sorry um, oh, because yeah. they're using a little bit of math because they're in elementary school and they're learning how to strategize to get to the win. So I like yeah. developing that with them. Monopoly is one of those games right? and it's like so polarizing. My family played Monopoly hard. Like we would get to the point where we wouldn't be kind about like, you know what? If you just want to call it, you can call it. I'd be like, no, mortgage all your houses. Get to the yeah, point give where me every complete- last time. Yeah, I want you to I want you to be completely broke and eviscerated. You know, yeah, and yeah. Then we'll give have me dessert, every piece right? of property you own. 
I want you to be destroyed. And then I win. Right? Like, great. That's, that's that right. sounds familiar. I was so obsessed that I would have like sleepovers with my friends just so that we can like attempt to finish the game. <laughs> and then we would probably pass out before we got anywhere near it. But yeah, I had issues. Yeah. It was always that those hotels on like the the orange and the light blue property that would murder oh. you, right? You'd get hotels on those, you're done. That's it. It's bringing us back. Okay, number two, which I mean, for all we know, number two may now correlate with number one. What's an irrational fear of yours? Sharks. Sharks. Well, that's kind of rash. I mean, well, the, but know. I'm not ever near them. Like I go in right. the ocean, maybe up to my abdomen. So why? Right. 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 And you're like, and I'm just around. And I'm like shark yeah. week. So I don't get it. Well, face your fears, you know, like expose yeah. your therapy, right? Like the more I see them. Okay. Number three, what is one piece of advice that you think everybody could benefit from? That's a good one. I think it's going to go back to what I was talking about earlier about slowing down and actually being intentional with what you're going to do. Am I delivering the experience that I want, whether that's a personal experience in your everyday life or a business experience in your nine to five life? Yes. Am I delivering the value that I want? What is what am I leaving with folks? I love that. Well, as mentioned, it's been wonderful talking to you. I imagine that folks would love to connect with somebody that has so much experience in this area with something that can benefit revenue so heavily. So where can folks find you, learn more about you, your company, what you're doing? Sure. Personal ABM is the best resource, a personalabm.com. And then reach out to me on LinkedIn. Please send me a personalized and relevant invitation to connect. And if you try to sell me right away, please don't get offended, but I will disconnect. Although that's where you could find a lot of your customers. You're like, that message was terrible. Do you want help? <laughs> that is true. Well, I sometimes say that to people. I mean, does this actually work? And yeah. then, of course, they'll like, they don't ignore me. Or they'll say, yeah, I was trying to do this. And I was like, well, then I'll give them like a tip of how to improve it for next time. It depends on the mood. Yeah, right. Sometimes we don't have the time to help people yeah. like that. Well, thank you for taking the time with us. And that's all, folks. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Taking the Lead. If you're looking for more inspiring stories from women leaders in B2B tech, then visit us at motionagency.io slash taking the lead.